I watched the Casey Anthony documentary series this weekend. I also then spent more than a few hours going through some of the commentary afterward. And as a survivor and a trauma therapist who has worked with survivors of childhood trauma for over 20 years, I have some thoughts. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Peggy Oliveira. Thank you so much for joining me. If you're new, make sure to subscribe and click the bell for notifications. So first, I want to be clear that this video is not my commentary on her, on the documentary, or on even whether or not she is telling the truth about what she shared in the documentary. I'm doing this video because once again, there is so much out there right now, basically suggesting that all the reasons why things can't be true, the things that survivors do or say cannot be true. And this is incredibly damaging to survivors. It's also incredibly damaging to the ideas that regular everyday people hold about what it means to be a survivor. And we cannot expect people to come forward and we certainly cannot expect abuse to stop if we cannot all be on the same page about the reality of what it means to be a survivor. So if you are a survivor watching this, hopefully I can help balance some of what you're hearing. Um, and if you are not a survivor, first, thank you for watching this because most of my information is geared towards survivors and healing. Um, but hopefully also you are getting a balance to this. So again, my perspective is as a survivor, but even more so as somebody who has been clinically trained and held a clinical license, worked with survivors for a very long time, and continues to work with survivors um, for over 20 years. So I've worked with a lot of people who have had an array of abusive experiences and and even how they have coped with it. While there's a ton of similarity, there are certainly some differences. And so while I am not the expert, I feel like I can say that I am kind of an expert in the reality of what it means to be a survivor and how that can show up in the world. So that is the perspective that I am sharing from. So the thing, the commentary that I saw afterward, I looked at several things. I watched um, a few different types of podcasts and really everything that I saw was basically suggesting that she is lying and all the reasons why they believe that she is lying. And so again, I made a couple of pages of notes that I wanted to go over. I know I'm not going to get to all of it. Um, so I'll give you an opportunity. I'll go through some of it at the end to give you an opportunity to share with me what you would like me to address if there's something specific in a future video. But I really just want to talk about, well, I want to talk about a lot of it. Um, one of the first things is that what we often tend to hear is people saying, well, it just doesn't make sense. If this were to happen, then I would do this. Or it doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable that this could happen in this way. As survivors, how often have we said to ourselves, I just don't understand why I didn't say no. I don't understand why I did this. I don't understand why I didn't come forward. I don't understand why I coped in this way, right? And there are so many reasons for that. But as humans, we need to make sense out of things. It's part of how we survive, literally, for centuries. It's how, in making sense out of things, if something isn't working and we can understand why it didn't work, then we can course correct and make sure that doesn't happen again, right? It's not real, it's not necessarily true, but we like to believe that it is because it gives us a sense of control. So 
much of what's out there is, it just doesn't make sense. And in all reality, there are things that on a logical level may not make sense. But here's the thing about psychology. Here's the thing about being a survivor of childhood trauma, or kind of any trauma really, but particularly childhood trauma. We don't respond to things, generally speaking, from a rational place. Well, in fact, I would say that most of us when there's some sort of emotional thing happening, some sort of stressful thing happening, we're not often responding from a rational place, which is why people that don't have any history of childhood trauma can get road rage or um, yell at somebody that they love or self-sabotage, right? So we are emotional beings. So much of how we respond to things is not from a rational, logical place. So that's across the board. That is the reality. So when we are not acting from a logical, rational place, there are a lot of things that aren't necessarily going to make sense. Like when we overreact to something, somebody could look at that and say, well, it just doesn't make sense. Like, why would you do that? But there are a lot of reasons why even if they're not good reasons, right? Like they're not healthy reasons. They're not excusable reasons. There are still reasons. And you may not be aware of them. They may not make logical sense, but that doesn't change that there aren't reasons. And it's important to recognize that, that something can not make sense and there's still being very valid reasons why it's happening. And when it comes to things that don't make sense about survivors and how they feel, what they think, how they respond, how they show up in the world, or whether they come forward as a child or as an adult, there are a lot of things that may not make sense, but it doesn't make them any less real and true. So I think it's important to remember that. Um... Much of the commentary was stated as factual. Well, if this, then this. And I want to be clear that for the most part, much of the commentary out there are not experts on human behavior. They're certainly not experts on clinically treating survivors and really having the long-standing relationships with survivors, understanding how the process of healing unfolds. Um, in fact, none of the people of that I read or heard would fit into that category. Um, but stating things as fact, I will say that one of the podcasts was somebody who is a body language expert. He said he has a certification in something. Um, he said he has a degree in psychology and sociology, um, I'm assuming undergraduate degrees. I don't know that to be the case for sure, um, but he's supposed to be a body language expert. That's, I think, what his channel is about. Um, for this particular podcast episode, he had a forensic psychiatrist on who, um, as a forensic psychiatrist, Generally speaking, much of what they do is related to the field of criminology. And so they do a lot of evaluating of people that are accused of crimes, understanding what kind of person would commit certain types of crimes, that sort of thing. Um, so generally speaking, they don't have longstanding relationships with the people that they're conversing with. Um, their role is not to help people heal, generally speaking. Um, because healing is a long process, right? We have to continue to stay with it over years, much of the time. Um, the other two people, one of them is a journalist or was a journalist, I believe. Um, and then the other person, there was nothing that I saw that would make her an expert in this, anything related to this. She, her podcast is a true crime podcast. In her podcast, I only listened to parts of it. 
um, because it was a very long podcast. And quite frankly, I, I was very annoyed with it in the first several minutes and I wasn't about to watch the whole thing, but I skipped around to different parts and listened to pieces of it to get a sense of what she was referring to, what she was talking about, her ideas of things. And she clearly did not believe that she was telling, that Casey Anthony was telling the truth. Um, I don't believe in any aspect. And I, I will fully acknowledge I could be wrong because I did not listen to the whole thing. I also happened to look at comments. The people, just regular people, left on these videos. And the comments were very similar to what was being said in the videos themselves. Um, and again, for people listening, whether you're a survivor or not, and reading these comments, it is so incredibly damaging to the idea of what it means to be a survivor of childhood trauma, of childhood sexual abuse in particular. So incredibly damaging. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the, how I narrowed it down into some of the um, quotes that I pulled from what people said. And again, I'd like you to share with me in the comments if there's something in particular that you would like me to address or something that really stands out to you, something that you've heard and you recognize just how impactful it is, let me know in the comments. Um, I will likely do some follow-up videos to this in terms of addressing these lies and myths that came up. And if there's other ones that you would like me to address, please make sure to share those as well. So again, just a reminder that there were three podcasts that I listened to, that I watched part of at least, and all of them had huge platforms. Um, the True Crime podcast, I happened to notice, had over 300,000 views, and her channel um, has 774,000 subscribers. So when you think about just the, the breadth of people, the impact, the layers, the, the ripples, out to that many people who are going to hear this and take it as fact. And it's not. It just simply isn't. And even from the forensic psychiatrist, I, I made a couple of notes of things that he said that I was honestly a little disappointed to hear. Um, and I don't know him, so it's not about him specifically, just disappointed and frustrated. So again, I'm going to go through these quickly. I'm going to try not to address them. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to try not to really go into them now because again, I want I don't want this video to be that long. Um, but I want it to be clear that any of these things I'm about to address, like name here, I obviously disagree. It's It's a myth, it's a lie, and it's important that we understand the reality of it. So... Real abuse victims would have no problem coming forward. This, I heard this like very early on as I started watching the first podcast. Um, real abuse victims, and she, there was so much conviction in how she was saying this. So much, like it was vitriolic almost, like real abuse victims wouldn't have a problem coming forward. Well, no matter the context, she clearly doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, another one, and this is re kind of related, if it were true, so if the sexual abuse were true, she'd have said something because she was facing the death penalty. Again, not true. And who are you to say with a, without any doubt whatsoever that she would have. So there's a lot that I could say about this and, uh, and even why it could happen. The next one, the problem is not what we're seeing now 
in terms of the documentary. It's the difference in what we saw then. So this person is suggesting, and this is actually the um, body ex or body language expert. What he's suggesting is that the discrepancy in what we're seeing now and what we saw then, or what she's saying now and what she said then, that that's the problem. And because there's a discrepancy, it would suggest or mean that she can't be telling the truth. Obviously, I disagree with that. And there's so many reasons, so many reasons. Um, obvious, actually, to me anyway, they seem obvious. And this is the difference between somebody who really understands what it means to be a survivor, like really understands and not just has some, you know, read a book or something like that, and somebody who doesn't. Um, another thing that was said, and I believe even the forensic psychiatrist got in on this idea, the fluctuating levels of certainty. So he talked about how um, at different points, even within the documentary, she would talk about her, talk about different pieces. And sometimes she was very confident in what she remembered or happened. And sometimes she would reference it or in something she said previously, there would be some idea that she was not quite as certain. Well, there's a lot of reasons why this can happen too, especially over time as people are healing. There's more, definitely more I can say about that, but, um, but again, these are things that they are saying that they are suggesting are, are reasons why it absolutely cannot be true. And it's just not. Um, the forensic psychiatrist, this is something that he said, never seen a case of repressed memories and vivid memories. I was shocked actually when I heard him say this. So he's basically saying that in his experience, and I think he's been doing this work for quite a while as a forensic psychiatrist, he said he's never seen a case of somebody having both repressed memories and vivid memories. He also at one point mentioned suppressed memories, and there is a difference. I'm not getting, getting, going to get into that. But basically saying that somebody cannot have vivid memories and repressed, repressed memories. Absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. Certainly more I can talk about there. Um, he also happened to mention um, that typically if somebody starts having new memories, it's because there's something that's happened that's reminded them of the abuse. That doesn't have to be the case at all either. Like there's something specific that reminded them of the abuse experience that they're remembering. Absolutely not true. There are any number of reasons um, why that can happen. Another statement. She had control for those 31 days. Where is that level of control now? She's not the same person. So this was in reference to her daughter had been missing for 31 days before anybody knew that she was missing. And um, during that 31 days, she was living her life as though everything was really great. And so in the documentary, she became emotional quite often. So he's suggesting here that during those 31 days that her daughter was supposedly missing, that she showed no emotion. She was not upset at all, no indication. And now here she is all these years later and she's got all this emotion, suggesting that the emotion is not real. Um, Again, this isn't about her. This isn't about whether she's telling the truth or not. But there are so many reasons that this could happen. So many reasons that somebody could be looking as if everything is absolutely fine and then years later talk about it and not be fine. That's actually something that happens so often in this healing journey. Um, something the forensic psychiatrist said, if the father was so horrible, then she should have been concerned for her daughter. 
If the father is so horrible, then she should have been concerned for her daughter. Now, there are so many reasons why somebody may not be as vigilant. Um, so many reasons why. And so for the forensic psychiatrist, and, and not even, you don't even have to have a lot of experience working with survivors over a long time. There's so many reasons. So many reasons why this could happen. Um, another thing that was said is, you didn't want to open the box then, but have no problem doing it now. So she talked about how um, basically she just couldn't really talk about it, she couldn't face it, whatever, all, that, all those years ago. Um, so he's suggesting that you didn't want to talk about it then, but you're fine talking about it now, therefore it's probably made up. Well, again, if you just think about the process of healing, if you've done any healing yourself um, or know people that have gone on this healing journey, that's the reality of what healing looks like. And actually, I would say that that's the reality of what therapy often looks like. No matter what you're going to therapy for, right? You put it off, you pretend it's not a big deal, you compartmentalize it, whatever, and then you get into therapy and you start really realizing how many boxes there actually are, boxes you didn't even know existed. That's just the reality, no matter who you are. So uh, lots I could say about that too. And then a couple of comments that stood out to me, again, under the video. So these are just regular people watching the videos. And this is part of the reason that I wanted to address this because so many comments and every comment that I saw was basically in alignment with the video itself, the podcast itself. So one of the comments, and I saw various versions of this, but one in particular was so, like there was so much energy with it by the capitalization of things and stuff. She said, or she, I believe it was a female. She said, I can tell you for a fact. I can tell you for a fact, abuse victims would never leave their child with their abuser. <sighs> so much I could say about that. But again, the idea that people hold that somebody would never leave their child with an abuser and therefore somebody must be lying about it or therefore that person is a horrible parent. Like it just, in a sense, it breaks my heart. Just thinking about the damage that that does. And the reality is that there are survivors who could actually say something like this. Um, obviously not true. And then finally, she didn't, she didn't tell the cops about dad, but she did on someone who threw a drink on her. So clearly it didn't really happen. And I saw different versions of this as well, but I saw it across <laughs> the videos. Um, so apparently she must have called the police on someone after they threw a drink on her or, or told the police that somebody threw a drink on her at some point. Um, but didn't tell the cops about her dad. Again, like this is fact. So this is clear evidence. If she was t willing to tell the cops about this and she didn't tell the cops about this, clearly that couldn't be true. Absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. There's so many reasons why this could happen. So many. So if you've watched the documentary, I, I would be interested in hearing just kind of your own, not necessarily even whether you're thinking she's telling the truth or not, but just what came up for you as you watched it. Um, because even as survivors, we can have a strong reaction to something and disbelieve other survivors. Um, and a lot of that is about self-protection. Um, and again, let me know in the comments if there's anything specifically here you would like me to address because there are definitely some things here that I've got some things to say about. So thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, interesting, if you think somebody else might find benefit in it, make sure to give it a thumbs up because it really does help other people find it. 
And again, if you haven't yet subscribed, make sure to do so and click the bell for notifications. I'll look forward to seeing you next time and sharing a little bit more about all of this too.